So um, the idea of this talk is to um, talk about World Broker, the new communication system for Borough, which is replacing what we currently have in kind of a staged way. And just to kind of recap a little bit about the communication itself. So we have developed the original version, I think, in like 2003, 2004, and has been like, like on duty since then. It's, it's doing its job, but it has some shortcomings which we're addressing with this, this new version. And um, just to kind of recap a little bit, so the communication in Bro really has like three different uh, tasks to fulfill. One is exchanging events between independent Bro instances. Right? So you have two Bro pro processes, and um, it separates the event generation from the handling. If you um, remember the layered architectures from Vern's talk this morning, um, where you have the, have the event engine and the scripting layer, um, in a standard setup, the events go from, well, the event engine to the scripting layer. Now we have a second bro instance, and the events can actually be sent over the network to the other scripting layer so that the handling takes place at this other end of the connection. So that is one, exchanging events, and it's very helpful for uh, primarily for message passing. So if you want to implement a message pass passing paradigm between different instances, you, you can use that. And the Samsung framework, for example, is doing, is doing that. Um, the second area for the communication framework is remote logging. Um, that is what, in particular, the Bro cluster is using for sending the logs from the workers to the manager system. So the logs are actually generated on the worker systems which see the traffic, and then the log entries are sent over to the manager, and that is the system writing it to disk. It's using the communication system for doing that. And finally, um, the third piece is distributing state. It's this notion of um, you have multiple bros running and they all see parts of the traffic and you really want, to want them to correlate the state information they accumulate over time, like a distributed scan detector, for example, or um, you want to remember which software you have, you have seen for a particular IP and you really want all of them to have kind of the same view of this information. So these are the, the three areas and the two use cases primarily for this is, I already mentioned the, the bro cluster. Um, which is using all three of them. Um, first, I'm showing the, the logs and the events. If you have the, most of you guys know this, this architecture, so the workers and the managers. So the, the logs and the events go directly from the workers to the manager and vice versa, for the events at least. And then there's second for synchronizing state, for distributing state across the workers, there's this additional tool, the proxy, which I believe for, for, for some people still is a, is a mystery what it's actually doing. Um, so the idea here is that we have this synchronized keyword currently in Bro. So you can, um, at the scripting layer, declare a global variable as synchronized. And what it means is it will, it, it's, it's going to be transparently shared across all the, all the Bro instances you have, you have running. Um, and that works by sending state updates, essentially. So if you have a global table and one of the bros is inserting an element into this table, this update operation is sent over to the other bros. Um, if you did actually this way, every bro would need to talk to every other bro, which is kind of prohibitive in terms of the number of connections you need. Therefore, we have the proxy, and the proxy is actually kind of introducing the star topology. Everybody is sending these, these operations to the proxy, and the proxy is broadcasting that out. Um, so that is the one use case. The second use case for the communication for these um, three um, pieces, actually only for, for the events, um, is that we can integrate with other applications. Um, and that is essentially Broccoli, what Tim was talking about. And we can send events from other applications to Bro. We can send Bro events to other applications, or we can have a bidirectional exchange here. And people have been using that for a range of different things, including sending syslog information into Bro or um, earlier versions of the instrument at SSHD. We're using that. Um, the other way, you can send Bro's decision to other system, like putting firewall routes in place, stuff like that. So it's this interface to other external components. Um, looking at the current system, so how, how this works currently is, so we have these three areas, events, logs, and state updates. And let's say we want to exchange these between a Bro A and a Bro B. Um, what right now happens is that actually these Bro processes, they spawn child processes dedicated to this communication. This is why if you have a bro running and you run top, you will usually see two processes for each bro instance you started up. Um, you can differentiate them by, by looking at the niceness level. So the communication sub process is actually running a bit at, at level, uh, niceness level five, I believe. So in these child processes, which is essentially offloading the communication IO load from the main process, these child processes speak our bro communication protocol between them and do all this, this um, state exchange. Um, 
part of that communication can be an external application, as I said, and that is the, the Broccoli, the Bro client communication library, which can hook into the same protocol. However, it's restricted to only doing events. So you can't do the logs, you can't do the state updates with Broccoli, uh, which is one limitation of the current system. Um, Broccoli is a C library. We have bindings for Python, Ruby, and, and Perl. And then C Sharp, I just learned. <laughs> um, so, as I said, basically this system was introduced in, in like 2003, 2004. It was actually, one was talking about some papers which were hard to publish. This was one of them. <laughs> um, so you had to frame this as a research effort. Um, independent of that, it's, it's really showing its age at, at this point. So there's, like, there's a fundamental problem with the synchronized keyword actually. And that is something which, in theory, it sounds really nice to have this transparency and it's a little bit of magic. You just declare something as synchronized, uh, just a little attribute to the global variable and magically everybody sees the same. Under the hood, that is really complicated um, because Bro is a complex system, um, the state management is complex, the data structures are complex, and you have to synchronize um, the state consistently across different players while keeping up with all that network traffic in real time. So that introduces certain limitations. Um, we kind of accepted that when we built the system, but it's really not so nice because you can end up with different nodes having different views of the data. Um, there's, there's no real good persistent story, so we can actually write this to shared state to disk, but in a, in a very like fragile way, um, not going much more into that. There's not much control over the data flow in the sense of Pretty much everybody shares everything with everybody, so it's hard to kind of, at a more fine granular level currently, to say, I only want this little piece of information. Um, the implementation and the protocol is pretty complex, pretty inefficient, partially or actually primarily due to um, this complexity of the synchronized keyword. And um, that is kind of a trade off which um, we are kind of shifting the other way now with the new system. Um, and last but not least, it's, it's really two different implementations of this protocol. So it's, it's the implementation in Bro, which was their first speaking, this, this communication protocol. And then Broccoli is a separate implementation of the same thing. Um, not everybody realizes that immediately. It's not that Bro is using Broccoli. Broccoli is just being used for external applications. We are changing that too. Um, so that's the current state. The broker library is supposed to make all of this better. And um, again, we want to have a, we have a bro A, we have a bro B, we want to do events, logs, state updates. Um, first of all, broker is actually a library um, in the sense of as Broccoli was a library, but now it's being used by bro itself as well. So each of these, these two bro instances here, um, they are linking actually to the broker library. In the same way, an external application can link to the broker library, and it becomes kind of an equal part of the communication. So it can also do events, logs, and state updates, just the same way. There's really no difference in this sense between Bro itself and external applications. Um, broker has a C++ API, um, but you also are already providing bindings for both C and Python, and I imagine in the future we will have more. So we are kind of going for diversity here and want to make it really easy to integrate with, with different systems. Actually, particularly the C API, I think, is pretty important because a lot of like existing application applications have that as their language of choice. Um, so Broker is a unified library. It's also a completely new protocol. Um, there's not even an attempt at backwards compatibility, so you really need to replace what you're currently using if you're using the communication with Broker. It's a published subscribe model, and this addresses the, the granularity of getting information. So, so we have topics, and you can say, okay, I'm interested in the following topic, and that is a subset of the information which is provided across the whole setup. We are limiting the type system in, in certain ways to get rid of some of this complexity, and that is, in particular, the, the main piece here is we, we do not allow like pointer data structures. So it, with the current, if you look at Bro's current data structures or Bro's data structures, you can have very, build very complex setups that with records of records, and then they can share like references um, jointly to other records. Um, Broker essentially rolls out these types, and it just flattens them out and sends them over. So this is, this is the main limitation. And we make ex state operations explicit in the sense you really have to express, I'm inserting an element into a table. I'm making a change here. Rather than this transparent one attribute, everything automatically. I'm going to show what this turns into. Um, so let's get more concrete and look at these three areas. So exchanging events with broker. Um, let's say the sender, we have a sender and a receiver. And the sender bro raises this event, a custom event, my event, two arguments, bro as a string, and the 42 as a count. 
And the first thing the sender does is actually declare a topic along with this event. And it says, okay, every instance of my event I want to associate with the topic is just a string. I just call it bro slash event here. Um, I could do it more fine granular, like for our HTTP events. Maybe you could use bro slash event slash HTTP. Um, I'm just doing like the, 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 the course scheme here. Then the receiver um, expresses interest in that. It sets up the connection to the, to the sender and says, okay, I'm subscribing to all events with the topic bro slash event. And then from that moment on, every time this event, my event is raised at the sending level, the receiver receives a copy over the network and, well, raises it locally. And then the, exe the handlers execute over there. And to demonstrate that it's really as easy as that, I want to show how this looks like an actual bro code. So let me get my windows right here. So I'm having two windows here for two processors. And I prepared some code. Let's look at the receiver first. Um, event receiver. This is a little piece of bro code. Actually, let me get some space. Um, so the receiver. Um, every time we receive an event from the sender, we want to execute this piece of code. Simple bro event handler for our custom my event um, with the corresponding arguments. So these are the three lines of code the receiver needs to make this happen. So first of all, we need to enable the broker communication framework. Um, then we need to subscribe to the events, as, as I sh have shown it, and we actually need to, well, listen for incoming connections. In principle, it, it, it's, it's, um, there's, no, there's no predefined direction for exchanging, uh, or connection direction for exchanging stuff. So, so either side can listen, either side can connect, but one side need to, needs to open up the socket. So um, we listen on this port on the local interface. And this is just kind of a hack because I'm, I'm, I'm working offline here um, so that I prevent Bro from immediately executing, uh, exit, ex I prevent Bro from immediately exiting once it has executed this code. I just want to kind of hang it around because it's going to receive connections. Um, I have a sender too, um, which is this one, which is pretty similar, so it enables on the sending side the broker communication framework. It does this assigning a topic to an event I showed, right? So, so it's like every time my event is, is, is raised here, um, assign the topic bro slash event, and then connect to this other guy on, part, on, on this part. Um, and in this case, because this is a bit of an artificial um, setup, I say, so once this outgoing connection is actually, actually established, so I need to wait for like a little bit of handshake going on there, once it's actually um, established, I trigger this event because I want to send this over. And the same like hack down here. So let me run these two. And um, well, I guess you can imagine what will happen. Um, well, there it is. Right? So the event was generated here, sent over the network, received here, handler executed, printed out. I said that we have bindings for broker. So and I wanted to demonstrate this real quick. So one is um, I have a C++ version of the same code here. Actually, let me do this. And it pretty much looks the same, roughly speaking, as the bro code. Um, so we initialize the broker framework in C++. We set up the connection. This looks a bit different because it's, it's split in between creating an endpoint and actually doing the connection. Um, this one here is kind of the equivalent of that event waiting until the connection has been set up. It, 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 it means um, wait for this outgoing connection to change its status. Normally, you would kind of check whether it's actually established. In this case, I'm just waiting for something to happen on that outgoing connection, assuming that it will be the connection set up. And then I'm creating the event in C++ here. And you see, um, Broker has a slightly more general abstraction in internally. It uses messages. And the convention is that for Bro events, the first element of a message uh, is just a series of fields, essentially, the f is, is the name of the event. And then the following subsequent um, elements of that me message correspond directly to the argument of that event. And then I send it over, give it the topic, and wait for, for stuff to finish. So I can have a little make file here. Um, 
which compiles this. And the command line is really pretty straightforward, so we make to, need to make sure we are actually using C++11 because Broker requires that, and we are linking with a bro li Broker library. And once I start the thing which comes out of that, over here, there's the C++ event. So it's pretty straightforward, actually, to use this just from C++ as well. Um, and, well, I have a Python version. This is the same code in Python. Right, so, and look at it, it, it follows the same structure. Actually, it's closer to the C++ version. Endpoints, outgoing connection, waiting until it's established, creating the message, sending the event, and waiting for um, connection going down, essentially. Well, let's try it. There's the Python event. And just for completeness, ah, okay, Python is a bit a pain to kill because <laughs> Okay, uh, ignore that. Um, C version, a little bit more um, verbose, uh, verbose but, um, because it's C, so you have to kind of go through some more hoops, but essentially it's doing, again doing the same thing. It's, it's setting up the endpoint, it's connecting, this is creating the, the message, so you don't have this nice C++ constructor here. Okay, I don't, dem oh, actually I do demonstrate it, why not? Oops. This one actually compiles much quicker. I don't know if you noticed. So C is, well, the adva one advantage of using C com compared to a heavily template-based uh, C++ API is that compile times go down significantly. Um, okay, so there we have the C event. So the bottom line here is it's, it's really kind of essentially the same process to send events to a broker-enabled endpoint, bro in this case, but it could actually be also on the other side. It, it doesn't need to be bro. It could be an application as well of yours. Um, it's pretty much the same process, no matter which of these languages you use. Okay, let me go back to my um, presentation. So that was sending events, pretty straightforward. The second area I was talking about is forwarding logs with broker. And I'm not going to demo this, but because it's really just a, a, a similar, very similar thing. So a, a log entry in Bro is generated by a function call to the logging framework. And that is this, this log write over there. And the, and the log write receives, well, the fields which are going to end up in that log file, right? Um, what we want to do is we want to send this log right over to the other side and execute it over there. And it just works in pretty much the same way as it does with the events. We declare a topic for, um, in this case, for a log file. Um, I just do bro slash log. You could do bro slash log slash HTTP if you wanted to kind of um, make it more fine granular. And then on the other end, I do subscribe to logs based on this topic. And then from that moment, every time the sender logs a line, this write goes over the network, ends up at the receiver, and the receiver does this log write on its end and does the actual logging. This actually means um, that the receiver can decide here which logging writer to use. So it's just the data going over the network, not the formatting. So on the, on the, on the receiver side, you can decide whether you want to text, write this into text files, into Elasticsearch, whatever writer you have. Um, so this is, this is kind of separated. That is forwarding logs. The final piece, and that is the most complex, but also the most powerful piece, is a new concept which we call data stores. And this is re the replacement for the synchronized attribute. And again, it's taking a lot of the, the transparency out, a lot of the magic out, making things more explicit and more limited in the, in the capabilities, but much more well-defined and I think still as powerful in the end as, as the old system. Um, and then the main observation here is that, bro, uh, that the broker introduces the notion of global persistent key value stores. So all your nodes participating in that communication, they have access with broker to a single global key value store where they can insert elements and look up elements and operate on elements. So for example, simple case, you have a distributed scan detector, you could count number of connection attempts per IP address inside this global key value store. And Broker and, and therefore Bro makes it really easy to access that and, and kind of integrate it into your analysis. And I'm going to show how this, how this looks like. Um, one, one, one 
piece about this setup is here that we give these key value stores names. So we can have multiple of them. Each gets a name. And for each, there's one master server, one master bro instance. Actually, it's a broker instance uh, responsible for the authoritative copy of that data store. And then there are a number of clients which connect to that. All, all, all of them get a shared view of the same content, but the master is in charge of, for example, the persistence. So the master can write it to disk and make sure it stays around. Um, I'm showing this first here in like some, some almost pseudo bro syntax how, how this works, and then I'm going to show the actual code. Um, so on the master side, we, we create a new store well, with an API called call create master, giving it a name, um, which means essentially this master creates this empty key value store down here. And we can start inserting elements into it. I'm just doing here IP addresses to, to counts. And then on the client side, I'm creating a clone of this. And clone has this, this kind of master slave relationship notion, right? So this is a clone of the my store thingy on that other side over there. Um, and that works by f creating first like a cached version of this key value store locally, which is initially empty, um, sending a clone operation over to that other side, and th the master responds by dumping over essentially the current content so that this guy can fill its own copy um, with the current values. So now we have them over here, right? And then they match over here. Let's say we have a second client doing the same. So down here, does the same clone operation. So now we have three pro instances all having the same data. And then we can start doing some operations. So this client over here could, well, maybe it just does a, a lookup first once I have the number associated with a specific IP address. Um, we are looking this up and it will get back, well, 21. Right? So this is easy because it can actually fulfill this request out of the local cache. It doesn't need to go over the network for doing that because it has the values locally. Um, it's more tricky for an insert. So let's say we want to insert a new IP address here with a specific number. Um, this insert is not done immediately on the local end. Instead, it's being sent over first to the master server. And the master server inserts it into its copy. And then it broadcasts these insert operations out to the other clients, including back to the original one. Um, this is a key piece of the, the, the protocol here because it makes sure that the master serializes competing accesses to the same entry. Um, we can't rule out that, that like these two clients might be, for example, inserting the same IP address at the same time with different values. And it's undefined what the final value will be in that case, but we can, can guarantee that all these three end up with the same view of the data eventually. It's essentially an eventual consistent model. Right, because all these operations go through here, they're serialized and then broadcasted back out. Yeah, this is the, the basic model, and let me show you how that actually looks in, in bro code. So I'm going back to my shells. Hey, Robin. Yeah. One thing, can you go back to that? Sure. Oops, that's the wrong slide. Yeah, when that insert happens, if the code in, on the left-hand side then now asks for the value of 192.151.743, mm -hmm. <coughs> what happens? It will it, get uh, not available at this time. It doesn't exist. So it, it will work from, the, from its cache until it has gotten the update from the server. But how does it know? It, so it tracks in the cache. By the way, it's not available? Or no, it's actually, it's, it's from, it's actually a, not, does not exist. So it's the same as if, if it had not been inserted yet. Like tricky if you've got a bunch of code that's going to bang way on a value. Um, yes, and if I'm showing the actual code for it, you will see that I'm using when statements to get around that, or because it's inherently asynchronous. Yeah. Other questions so far? Yeah. If it, if it what if it dies. Um, so the clients will notice that the connection goes go down. They will try keeping to reconnect, uh, attempting to reconnect. The master um, can either keep the data just in memory, in which case it's gone at this point, but it can also keep it persistently on disk in an SQLite database or RocksDB at the moment. 
Um, so what happens then, if the master starts up again, it will reload the data from disk, the clients will reconnect and get a new clone, essentially. We could optimize that. I don't think we do it yet, but we could optimize that. The, they only get like the, the updates or they do some kind of, I don't know, incremental scheme where they realize I already have most of it. But we don't do that. There's no re election process now. Um, so we go this, with this um, quite simple model of having a single master system. Eventually, we might add like, like redundancy so that like, there might be two masters for in, sh in, in charge of the same store with a failover mechanism or something like that. But uh, that's not there yet. Um, one, one thing worth noting, in the future, we may consider something like Wrapped, uh, which also at CD uses, which is a protocol that's mm -hmm. more resilient to distributed failure and network partitioning. I think that's where your question is heading. It, it, uh, it was actually something we discussed a long time ago, and I think the conclusion we ended up coming to was just leaving it off initially because yeah. it was such it, it, the, the existing work was such a huge amount of effort that we left that off, and, and I think it'll it should be amenable to sort of yeah. adding that in yeah. later. So conceptually, it, it would fit in very well. Theoretically, with us not implementing RAP. Right, but I think there are implementations yeah, one can I, leverage, I right? Created RAP yeah. at least a C++ yeah. implementation. So, so maybe that's some, like a generic point about broker. Broker is at the very beginning, so it's not kind of finalized. I'm also actually, if I'm going to show the, or once I, I show the code examples, there are some um, pieces about the API which aren't quite nice yet. But, but we, we decided to go with this state at the moment because it's not quite clear actually yet how it would look like if you would do it right. So we need to get some experience with, with this stuff first and we go for some simplifications initially. Okay, so let me clean this up. And let's look at um, data master first. So this is the code to create such a data store master. Um, we enable the, 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 the broker framework, we create the master, uh, we give it a name, and in this case I'm actually telling it, okay, please uh, back it up on disk as an SQLite database. So this gives you persistence across restarts. I'm uh, doing this, these, these two insert operations, which I showed on the slide, um, <coughs> And I just mentioned some pieces of the API which aren't quite nice yet, this wrapping of the data types into this, this data, um, uh, well, wrapper, is, is not, I think, the nicest way in the world yet, but that's something we will work on in the future. Um, and then we actually start listening here just as in the previous example. Let me do the client version of this. Um, well, first the easy part. We do the enable, we do the connect, just as before. Now, once the outgoing connection is actually established, uh, established we can start working on this, this uh, data store by first creating a clone, giving it the name. Um, it does the association with the, other, with the master server on the other end. Same name means that's the one I want. Um, content is dumped over. So then, the first thing I do here is actually just printing out the keys. What is the current, the current keys in the store? And I'm using, and this is um, going to Vern's point, or though a bit more generally, I'm using the when statement. So for those who don't know that, it's, it's for asynchronous operations in, in bro scripting language. Um, the problem is, in bro scripting language, you cannot block, as a, as a general rule. Whatever happens, you must not block processing, because, well, you're having this real-time traffic feed, and if you just wait for a second before some, some result appears from somewhere, uh, you have a problem. So that's why a while ago we introduced this when statement, which means um, wait for this um, expression here to produce a value which potentially can take a while um, because it's going to happen asynchronously and once that value is there, then execute the code. Um, there's a timeout clause, so if in this case, because it's an I.O. operation, if it doesn't complete within five seconds, then we abort and print the timeout. Um, I think the rest is commented out here. Okay. Let's do that. Let's do the master down here. And the client over here. So remember, there were two insert operations on the master side. So hopefully, yes. The current values which you're printing out here, so it's essentially a, a vector of the current keys, um, appear here. And again, they are wrapped in this data type, which is mainly for internal reasons right now. The reason for that is actually, there's a bit of a like, like typing mismatch between broker and, 
and, and Bro in the sense that the Bro scripting language is statically typed, as Vern was talking about. And, and broker messages, because they come from remote, you can't really predict what types they have. I think we can do some mapping there, and we can kind of automatically figure that out. But for now, we, we don't. So you need to kind of wrap this. Um, so that is that. Let's take another look at this, this code. I have some more stuff in here. So this is how you print the current keys. Here's the lookup operation. Um, and it's also wrapped in a when statement. And you see that we're looking up this particular IP address over here. And once we have that, and against an asynchronous operation, then we print it out. So if I run that, we get the current value over here. You might notice that the output order changes here. And that is because these when statements, well, they happen asynchronously. So in principle, they both get scheduled, so to speak, at the same time, but they might come back at different times. In this case, it has flipped the order. And finally, um, I have an insert operation. Actually, I have two more. I have an insert operation here. Let me do that. This is insert the new value with this IP address and this count. I execute it. Actually, we're not going to see anything right now because the print of the current keys happens first. But if I restart it, it now we have, so, have three keys in there. So we have inserted one to the other side. Maybe that's a good moment to actually restart the master and show, hopefully, that it still has three keys in there because it has backed up that into, into the SQLite database. That worked, fortunately. Um, so finally, just to demonstrate, so we also have an increment operation. So this is one of the more like data type specific operations. We can actually increment the value in the, in the store. Let me maybe take this one out. I'm, I'm incrementing the value for this 14.1 uh, key here. And actually, is that the one I'm looking up? Yeah, so that's the same as I'm looking up here, right? So if I run this, first we will see actually the current value, which was five, and then now it's being incremented. So if I restart this and, and do it again, there's a six, there's a seven, there's an eight. And again, if I restart the master down here, it should keep counting. It doesn't. Oh, I know why it doesn't, because because this one is actually overriding it. I still have the insert operations in there. So if this insert would not have been there, um, it would have kept the current value. Um, OK, so this is the, the operations. These, these, um, wrapping this into when statements is also a bit cumbersome. So that's another thing I'm hoping we can get rid of eventually by maybe changing the uh, semantics of the lookups, for example, a little bit, and going always um, well, we always already go into the, in, into the internal cache. What happens internally is there's a queue of operations. And both the, the external operations coming in and the local operations we carry out, including lookups, all first go into a queue. And this is what, what makes them asynchronous um, at the benefit of giving, having a well-defined order of what happens. Um, maybe a change could here be that for lookups, for example, we just skip, skip the queue in exchange for uh, getting some loser semantics there. Um, I'm not quite sure what the, what the right approach is. Um, for completeness, uh, that is the client. You can do the same in C++. So this is um, C++ clothes, same setup code here. There's the clone uh, doing the connection. And then I have, I think I have the printing of the keys in here, which in C++ is just a for loop over keys associated with the store. Um, let me go back to the store, it's over here. This is the, the clone. I iterate over that, I print it out, and then I do a lookup of this address. Lookup operation is here, I'm printing the result and doing the increment here. Right, so, and if I, uh, no, client CXX. Um, was there already an old version? There you go. So now that you see the output of the C++ version of the client. Right? So you see the keys being printed here. You see the current value being printed here. Um, of course, Python version looks pretty much the same, just in Python. The Python API also has some like little things which aren't quite nice yet. So this, this double keys here is kind of an artifact of wrapping things and wrapping things. Um, but otherwise, it's pretty straightforward in the same way. I'm not going to run it. 
Instead, I'm showing the C version, um, which looks like this. Again, a bit more. It needs a little bit more lines because it's C, but it's pretty straightforward. Just does what you would expect the C version to do. So um, the bottom line here is, again, you can do exactly the same operations um, from all these languages as you can do it in Bro, which I believe, I, I really hope that this kind of develops eventually into something where it doesn't really matter anymore if it's running a Bro there or if it's running some other application. Like the, the application maintaining these master stores doesn't need to be a Bro. There can be something else. Maybe something you can better interface with something or integrate somewhere. So it's really, you get a lot of um, uh, flexibility there in terms of how you structure your things and w where exactly Bro fits in. Matthias? You had this increment function. Yeah. Does that function work on any data type, or does it give an error for types uh, that do not support increment, or where increment is maybe not well defined, such an IP, yeah. IP address maybe, but for the string? And it, 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 it's certainly only, it's only supported for certain data types. I think actually only for integers, I believe. Um, and I suppose it gives an error message. I'm actually not quite sure. But I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it does. And, and the other comment that I have is you said earlier that with these when statements mm -hmm. that you no longer uh, can guarantee the uh, sequential order that you have in the code, in the source code. But um, you can nest when statements, True. right? Yeah. So this way, um, the body of a when statement is the continuation of the result of the previous asynchronous computation. And that way, you can get back to a sequential uh, mm -hmm. control flow. That is true. Yeah, you can kind of force an order on it if you need it. Yeah. I, believe, I would believe that for most applications, the order doesn't matter that much. Because you're probably, I mean, what is the typical operation? You're inserting elements based on something you see on the network. And they're probably quite different time when you actually do the lookup. Um, to, to correlate stuff together. So I'm, I'm guessing the order doesn't matter much in the end. Um, I'm also not sure actually whether the when statement does need to be that indeterministic. That might be something we need to look at. Other questions so far? Hi. Hi. Um, what was the kind of design decision around uh, basically building your own messaging protocol versus using ZeroMQ or NanoMessage yeah. or something else? <laughs> Good question. We are using a different low-level library, um, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. So we are not we are, we are building the high level ourselves, the data model essentially, yeah. and um, this, this this client master model. But we are using a, a networking library underneath, so that we don't need to re-implement all the I/O. Um, and with the uh, whole um, storage part, someone had mentioned about the partitions. What happens if like there is a network partition? I think it will, in this case, because the connection goes down, it will probably uh, give an error back. I'm actually not quite sure. Okay. Yeah. So again, we are, we are kind of, right now we're going with the most simple model. So if connection goes down, we assume, well, this operation cannot really succeed. And was there any like, reasoning besides behind not using, like, again, Zookeeper or SCD or like, some other mm -hmm. sort of yeah. Um, so so we, we, we looked at a number of things when we started this. And, and in the end, um, we decided to, that, that we want to kind of define the semantics of the data types pretty precisely, because we want to match them to what Bro does. We want to have a direct like one-to-one -one relationship there, um, which led us to kind of handing the high, the, the high level ourselves. Um, then for the lower level, we looked at 0MQ, for example, at, at NanoMessage, the, the 0MQ successor, and others, and we started using, I, mean, I haven't said it yet, but we're using CAF, the C++ Active Framework, which provides a lot of concurrency, a very straightforward API for doing this, this kind of message passing. And um, actually, in the end, compared to 0MQ, I think, uh, cut down the code quite a bit in terms of what we needed to implement compared to F, as if we had done it on top of 0MQ. Other questions? <coughs> not yes? I just wanted to uh, okay. add something. Go ahead. Yeah, answer. go ahead. So um, you, you asked why we're not using a Zookeeper at CD. That's, that was also a deliberate choice first to have a very simple, uh, understandable uh, model. Mm -hmm. and, and so far, most of the deployments we have do not use a very wide area of um, broccoli or bros communicating. We've been using that mostly to integrate third party, and that was uh, not a big network that, or a set of nodes that we're communicating. And, and with broker makes this actually much more easy in the future. Um, and once we're at that point, we were, we were thinking to add 
uh, more complex fault tolerant protocols such as uh, Raft, which etcd uses, or, or Zookeeper uses Paxos, so that's probably obsolete. It, and um, we use, we're thinking of adding Raft in the future, but that's down the line. Yeah, I'm just thinking from like my operations team knows how to operate Zookeeper or etcd or some of these other you know, data stores. They might not feel as comfortable you know, working with them. <laughs> Yeah, but Zookeeper, I mean, even Zookeeper is, for some, for somebody who has never used it before, it's, it's, it's a hurdle too, right? Yeah. I mean, in some sense, I mean, part of the reason why I'm showing these code examples is also de to demonstrate it's really easy to set this up. Um, if you're writing the, your, your own bro script and you want to make use of these, these distributed key value stores, it's just a few lines of code and you don't need any additional infrastructure or anything. Okay. Other questions? All right, so I... Uh, Continue here. So I'm, I'm, I'm mostly done with um, what I wanted to talk about, just kind of summarizing a bit more and a bit more details. So the data store features, um, what I said, so basically we, we tailored it so that the data types it supports are actually bros data types, roughly speaking. Um, a few exceptions, but more for the more esoteric types. And it supports them both for keys and values. Um, so that this mapping is, is really direct and you get the this, this semantics we need here. Um, we have these data type specific operations. So as you saw the increment, we can also, if you store a set, for example, you have like insert operations. You can in insert an element into a set, which is a value of a key. And you can remove elements from sets. Um, you can store vectors where you can actually like push and pop, append and, 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 and remove elements from, from beginning or end. Um, and finally, we have automatic expiry built in so that you can keep these key value stores, which automatically, if an element hasn't been accessed for a while, for example, um, automatically expire these elements. So you can remember, I don't know, the software for IP addresses for a month and then automatically kind of time them out, um, which is similar to um, the, the bro global tables where you have these, these read and write expires. And finally, I already said this, so we can, we have persistence and currently you can use either SQLite or Roxy, it's, internally it's abstracted actually, so you can put in a different uh, back end for the storage end as well for these tables or for these value stores, which is writing a little bit of C++ code. We're generally going back from uh, talking just about the data stores to broker as a whole. Generally, there is this, this rather fine granular subscription model allowing you to express interest in certain pieces by using topics or names and subscribing to that with a prefix based scheme. And um, on the other side, also determining what you, what you are publishing to others. Um, one important point is the security model. So we follow actually in this case um, the model we have been using so far with the current system and that is we assume the nodes participating in the communication are trustworthy. Um, practice has shown usually that is, is, is a verified assumption because you're using bros running in a contained network anyways. It's not world, reach, world reachable, it shouldn't I would say. Right, so people kind of usually contain that off. Um, you can use obviously um, tunnels and stuff or VPNs if you want to. Eventually we will also add SSL support because currently we don't have encryption authentication. That's mostly a piece of the under underlying communication library. But the, the, the basic model is um, we, we don't put specific assumption on the trustworthiness of the nodes. Well, I'm not sure that was the other way, right? So, so we, don't, we, we do trust them. So Brokers Foundation, and that goes back to, the, to that question, is, is CAF the C++ Active Framework? And that is, yes, we didn't want to implement all the low-level communication code ourselves. And this is a C++ framework, um, which really makes use of a lot of like, these advanced modern C++ features to provide a very streamlined, simple API. Internally, it's using um, this, this Erlang-style lightweight actor model, where you have lots of lightweight processing elements, essentially, that get scheduled among a set of worker threads. Um, and that gives you a nice, concise messaging API without having to care about the, the background there. It's also network transparent in the sense that if you have these two processes running on different systems, there will be a TCP connection between them. If you have two processes running on the same system, it can actually use inter-process comp inter communication, and it does that completely transparently. So you don't need to kind of care about the transport layer, essentially. It's efficient and, and, and pretty flexible, and uh, very important for us, it has a BSD license, so we don't have a problem using it. There's some trade-offs, and, and I mean, we, we thought about this for a while. I mean, one is, uh, well, it's using all these C++ modern features, so it does need a C++ 11 compiler, meaning that for Bro, um, as of current Git master, we are switching over 
to requiring a C++11 compiler, which we would have done anyways at some point because we want to modernize the bro code base as well, but this was the trigger for, for doing the switch. Um, CAF is also a new non-standard dependency, so it's not that well um, uh, distributed yet among distributions and OSs, but it's, um, they're, they're building packages now, they have like stable releases, and it's getting traction quite a bit in other communities as well. So I think it's, it's a good choice going forward, and it's, it's straightforward to set it up, so it's not, not a hurdle. So my last piece is a bit of like, like vision, and, and Vern was already talking about earlier about the, the deep cluster, right, where you go deep into a network, and I think broker is actually a, a, a key piece to making that happen. So and as an example, consider you have this maybe a geographically distributed organization, and you want to kind of roll out bro internally across departments, divisions, locations. Um, so maybe then you have this global master bro, which, which kind of controls the rest, and then you go down maybe to regional bros, right, which, which kind of oversee different countries in this, in this case. And then from there, um, you have the local clusters, there's different locations inside these countries, and there is the actual traffic monitoring being done, and, and results get propagated up the tree to the regional heads and to the global master. Um, if you use topics which Broker provides for subscribing to elements, you can very fine granularly control who's seeing what information. So the, um, everybody, or the, the, the global master would subscribe to everything underneath, and maybe the regional heads only subscribe to what's underneath them. You can do it more complexly, of course, as well. If there's some global information that, that the nodes down there need, they can subscribe to that. In addition, you can start adding these data nodes across the hierarchy. So if there's data which need to be shared globally across the whole setup, you add it like, can you see that? Hmm. Up, up there, at the global master. Yeah, point here. Um, and if you have information which only needs to be shared, in this case on a per country basis, you have the several data node here which keeps the key value stores just interesting to these guys. So you can kind of build hierarchies and you can, if you want, you can share across here as well and have some of them talk to here if they need to know what's going on in the UK. So it's, it's, it's a very flexible model, I think, which um, eventually Bro Control will, will actually be able to support and maintain and set up and make it easy to, to uh, administer. So that um, concludes almost my talk. The, the one additional point I wanted to make, Broker is, I've been kind of hinting at it, in some sense Broker is e even independent of Bro. Um, I see it kind of as a distributed real-time publish subscribe platform with a data model. So and this is something which I think in this combination doesn't exist yet. So that you have both this, this distributed model, a, a very simple API with like a very tight data model where you have type-specific operations on top. Um, but that's just as an aside here. What this all means for you right now, and that is kind of the roadmap. So in Bro 2.4, Broker is integrated. It just turned off by default. You can turn it on by giving configure the uh, switch enable Broker. What you will need is CAF in version 0.13, and you will need a C++11 compiler. In Git master, as of today, just I think last week, we did the switch to compile broker in by default, though you can still disable it if you want. Um, we have switched to requiring the, the, the current version of CAF, and um, for now, the legacy communication system, the existing one, still remains the primary mechanism. So if you, even if Git master right now, if you set up a cluster, it will be using the old stuff, and broccoli will still work. Um, for Bro 2.5, this is a bit tentative at this point because we're just starting the cycle. Um, but the idea is that for everything coming with Bro, Broker will be the primary mechanism. So we will be porting over the Bro control, the cluster framework, all that kind of stuff to Broker. But the old communication will remain available for now. Um, it will be deprecated, but you can use it. You can keep using Broccoli. And then, uh, it's even more tentative, um, in 2.6, uh, I really hope you can just remove the old communication code. The credit for all this broker work actually goes to John Silvek, who, who used to work for NCSA. He did all the implementation work here, and, and he did a fabulous job um, basically writing this whole thing from scratch, and it just works. Um, at this point, what we haven't done is, is like extensive load tests. So the basic functionality is just fine and working. We, we, we need to gather a bit more experiences actually with, with heavy loads and, and see if things work fine under stress. Uh, but I'm pretty optimistic. And, and again, John did a great work here. Um, you can blame all the shortcomings of the old system on me, and you can get the credit for the better stuff to John. <laughs> um, OK, and that concludes my talk. Any other questions? 
there is no proxy anymore. It's gone. Well, it will be replaced by the data node, but that is something which makes more sense. Yes, the name proxy is going away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the new the data nodes, which are the maintainers of these key value stores, um, that is something at least people will understand what it is, which I think the proxy people didn't. So it's essentially the master, yeah. I mean, so, so there, there are two ways to look at that. I mean, from, from the API perspective, you have a master, somebody in charge. Um, and, and what we will do, is yes, we'll assign, we will basically create a role in the cluster setup where um, a data node is the master for your key value stores. So it's, it's a role in that sense. And that's, it will be located somewhere, just as the proxy is located somewhere, the manager is located somewhere. It will act as the master.